In physics or engineering education, a Fermi problem or order of magnitude problem is an estimation problem designed to teach dimensional analysis or approximation of extreme scientific calculations, and such a problem is usually a back of the envelope calculation. The estimation technique is named after physicist Enrico Fermi, as he was known for his ability to make good approximate calculations with little or no actual data. Enrico Fermi, September 29th, 1901, to November 28, 1954, was an Italian, later naturalized American, physicist and the creator of the world's first nuclear reactor, the Chicago Pile-1. He has been called the architect of the nuclear age and the architect of the atomic bomb. He was one of very few physicists to excel in both theoretical physics and experimental physics. Fermi was awarded the 1938 Nobel Prize in Physics for his work on induced radioactivity by neutron bombardment and for the discovery of transuranium elements. With his colleagues, Fermi filed several patents related to the use of nuclear power, all of which were taken over by the US government. He made significant contributions to development of statistical mechanics, quantum theory, and nuclear and particle physics. Fermi's first major contribution involved the field of statistical mechanics. After Wolfgang Pauli formulated his exclusion principle in 1925, Fermi followed with a paper in which he applied the principle to an ideal gas, employing a statistical formulation now known as the Fermi Dirac statistics. Today, particles that obey the exclusion principle are called fermions. Pauli later postulated the existence of an uncharged invisible particle emitted along with an electron during beta decay to satisfy the law of conservation of energy. Fermi took up this idea, developing a model that incorporated the postulated particle, which he named the neutrino. His theory, later referred to as Fermi's interaction and now called weak interaction, described one of the four fundamental interactions in nature. Through experiments inducing radioactivity with the recently discovered neutron, Fermi discovered that slow neutrons were more easily captured by atomic nuclei than the fast ones, and he developed the Fermi H equation to describe this. After bombarding thorium and uranium with slow neutrons, he concluded that he had created new elements. Although he was awarded the Nobel Prize for this discovery, the new elements were later revealed to be nuclear fission products. Fermi left Italy in 1938 to escape new Italian racial laws that affected his Jewish wife, Laura Capon. He emigrated to the United States where he worked on the Manhattan Project during World War II. He led the team that designed and built Chicago Pile 1, which went critical on 2nd of December 1942, demonstrating the first human-created self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction. He was on hand when the X-10 graphite reactor at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, went critical in 1943, and when the B reactor at the Hanford site did so the next year. At Los Alamos, he headed the F division, part of which worked on Edward Teller's thermonuclear superbomb. He was present at the Trinity test on July 16, 1945, where he used his Fermi method to stimulate the bomb's yield. Fermi did important work in particle physics, especially related to pions and muons, as he speculated the cosmic rays that arose when material was accelerated by magnetic fields in, in interstellar space. Many awards, concepts, and institutions are named after Fermi, including the Enrico Fermi Award, the Enrico Fermi Institute, the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, or Fermilab, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, the Enrico Fermi Nuclear Generating Station, and the synthetic element Ferminium, making him one of the 16 scientists who have elements named after them. A great and beloved teacher, Fermi tutored or directly influenced no less than eight young researchers who went on to win Nobel Prizes. Fermi problems typically involve making justified guesses about quantities and their variance or lower and upper bounds. An example of this is Enrico Fermi's estimate of the strength of the atomic bomb that detonated at the Trinity test. Based on the distance traveled by the pieces of paper he dropped from his hand during the blast, Fermi estimated of 10 kilotons 
of TNT was well within an order of magnitude of now accepted value of 21 kilotons. But possibly the most famous Fermi question is the Drake equation, which seeks to estimate the number of intelligent civilizations in the galaxy. The basic question of why, if there were a significant number of such civilizations, ours has never encountered any others is called the Fermi paradox. Scientists often look for Fermi estimates of the answer to a problem before turning to more sophisticated methods to calculate a precise answer. This provides a useful check on the results. While the estimate is almost certainly incorrect, it is also a simple calculation that allows for easy error checking, and to find faulty assumptions if the figure produced is far beyond what we might reasonably expect. By contrast, precise calculations can be extremely complex, but with the expectation that the answer they produce is correct, the far larger number of factors and operations involved can obscure a very significant error, either in mathematical process or in the assumptions that the equation is based on but the result may still be assumed to be right, because it has been derived from a precise formula that is expected to yield good results. Without a reasonable frame of reference to work from, it is seldom clear if a result is acceptably precise or is many degrees of magnitude, tens or hundreds of times, too big or too small. The Fermi estimation gives a quick, simple way to obtain this frame of reference for what might reasonably be expected to be the answer. As long as the initial assumptions in the estimate are reasonable quantities, the results obtained will give an answer within the same scale as the correct result, and if not, it gives a base for understanding why this is the case. For example, suppose you were asked to determine the number of piano tuners in Chicago. If your initial estimate told you that there should be a hundred or so, but the precise answer tells you that there are many thousands, then you know you need to find out why there is a divergence from the expected result first looking for errors, then for factors that the estimation didn't take into account, like does Chicago have a number of music schools or other places with a disproportionately high ratio of pianos to people, whether close or very far from the observed results, the context of what the estimation provides gives useful information both about the process of calculation and the assumptions that have been used to look at the problems. Fermi estimates are also useful in approaching problems where the optional choice of calculation method depends on the expected size of an answer. For instance, a Fermi estimate might indicate whether the internal stresses of a structure are low enough that it can be accurately described by linear elasticity, or if the estimate already bears significant relationship in scale relative to some other value, for example if the structure will be over-engineered to withstand load several times greater than the estimate, although Fermi calculations are often not accurate, as there may be many problems with their assumptions, this sort of analysis does tell us what to look for to get the better answer. For the above example, we try to find a better estimate of the number of pianos tuned by a piano tuner in a typical day, or look up an accurate number for the population of Chicago. It also gives us a rough estimate that may be good enough for some purposes. If we want to start a store in Chicago that sells a piano tuning equipment, and we calculate that we need 10,000 potential customers to stay in business, we can reasonably assume that the above estimate is far enough below 10,000 that we should consider a different business plan, and with a little more work, we can compute a rougher upper bound on the number of piano tuners by considering the most extreme reasonable values that could appear in each of our assumptions. Fermi estimates generally work because the estimations of the individual terms are often close to correct and overestimates and underestimates help cancel each other out, that is, if there is no consistent bias. A Fermi calculation that involves the manipulation of several estimated factors, such as the number of piano tuners in Chicago, will probably be more accurate than might be first supposed. The power of estimation is amazing. The ability to construct close to accurate measurements with limited information is such a useful skill to have because it's encountered so often in the real world. This proves the high efficiency of the Fermi problem.